Hello and welcome to the Alatea Foundation podcast. My name is Stephen Cole. Today, we are delighted to be joined by Sarah Akbar. Ms. Akbar is a Kuwaiti chemical petroleum engineer, women's rights advocate, and co-founder and former chief executive officer of Kuwait Energy. Sarah is recognized as a national hero because of her firefighting efforts in the Kuwaiti oil fires and was subsequently awarded the Global 500 Roll of Honor from the UN Environmental Program. Ms. Akbar's tenacity has also been depicted in the Academy Award nominated documentary, Fires of Kuwait. Hello and welcome to the podcast, Sarah. Hello, and I'm happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me to this podcast. Not at all. No, it's a privilege. You have have had a long and a very distinguished career in Kuwait's energy industry. But let's go back to the beginning of your journey. Was it your oil driller father that was your main inspiration? Did he encourage you to join Kuwait Oil Company? Well, look, uh, so I started, I was born in an oil field. (laughs) <laughs> it's the Magua oil field. So I think maybe when I was a kid, I probably I drank some oil. I don't know. But anyhow, when I grew up in my childhood, I used to wander around oil fields. So it became my natural habitat. That's why I think, you know, when I wanted to study, I thought I study chemical engineering and then, then I can work in the refinery, which was just next to my door. I was as a child. I used to go under the fence of this refinery and wander around the refinery. So it's just natural. It was very natural for me to be part of the industry. So that's why when I finished chemical engineering, I joined the Kuwait oil company and I started my career. But uh, for somebody like me... It's very true to say you have oil in your blood in the nicest possible way. And uh, eventually... Uh, you left the Kuwait Oil Company to found, co-found Kuwait Energy. Tell us more about that process of starting a new company in the industry and the, the reasons for the move. So I worked for Kuwait Oil Company, which is the national oil company for Kuwait, for about 23 years. And then at the last few years of my career, I worked as a business development manager developing business for Kufpec, which is the upstream EMP arm for KPC, all over the world. And I developed lots of relationships and, uh, you know, uh, we used to operate in 17 countries. Now, towards the end of my career with KPC, I thought I was trying to get them some of the best projects available in the market. But the, as a national oil company, we were not efficient enough and competitive enough to get these opportunities and execute them. I tried to change the system. I was not successful because of the politics of working with a national company. So I thought to myself, I've worked in this industry for 23 years. I actually, I owe Kuwait. They don't owe me anything. I, uh, you know, because I was very hardworking and spent a lot of hours. I was very diligent in whatever I do. So I thought to myself, I can really do better if I exit, create a company and capture these opportunities that I already know. And that's when I said, "Mm, let's do it. And I exited. I find few investors who were very interested in the business. And uh, we created Quet Energy, and the focus of our business was to do upstream, mainly, mainly in Iraq. And there is a reason for that. I thought the only way we can mend our relationship with Iraq after what happened in 1990 is if we can develop through the private sector economic relationships that work for both, win-win relationships. And in my mind, there were few fields in Iraq that has gas. We could develop this gas, bring it to Kuwait because Kuwait needed gas. And this was the spark that actually, uh, you know, I thought about in order to create Kuwait energy. So the first thing I did, I went to Iraq. I said, look, there is this gas field. It's like 30 kilometers from our border. It's just sitting there. I want to develop this field, take the gas to Kuwait. And, you know, it's interesting that the Iraqis love the idea. And that's how we started Kuwait Energy. Well, you've painted a picture of the geography 
uh, of the region very clearly because I want to move on to the invasion of Kuwait by Iraqi forces in the early 1990s. Uh, it was a, a war I covered uh, from London. It was a dark time for the region as, as the Iraqi military retreated from Kuwait. They set fire to more than 700 oil wells along with uh, oil filled low lying areas. And it was very much a policy of a, a scorched earth policy, wasn't it? While, while retreating yeah. from Kuwait, yeah. you were part of that operation to extinguish those fires. Tell us more of your firefighting ex exploits. So, so before I move to the firefighting, actually, I was an eyewitness um, when the Iraqis blew up the wells. Why? Because on the seven months of invasion, I was continuously working at KOC, trying to secure gas and oil for the people who stayed in Kuwait during the invasion. So I continued to work. I watched them. I knew everything they did. And I used to prepare daily reports for the government from where I was. Now, after they retreated, you know, before they went, uh, left Kuwait, they blew up in like 700, more than 735 wells. Yeah. And it was a huge challenge. So we developed a small plan in the beginning. What are the priorities? Because, you know, you cannot do all immediately. So the priorities were all those wells to take care of the wells on the roads close to the city, the big ones, the, you know. So we had few wells in priority. But then, of course, we started to receive all these uh, firefighting teams. And when these firefighting teams came, there was almost nothing in Kuwait. You know, Kuwait was almost empty because... <laughs> Uh, either Everybody it was looted or burnt or, you know, mm -hmm. not even accommodation, proper accommodation. So things had to be quickly prepared through the um, project uh, to uh, prepare grounds for firefighting teams to come and bring the logistics, bring the equipment, bring bulldozers, you name it. Everything that uh, was needed uh, was actually transported into Kuwait through this uh, uh, civilian airlift. Uh, operation, but uh, I started giving the various teams data information about the wells because, you know, the, the, some of these wells were challenging. The firefighters did not know why this was the situation, but I knew all these wells like the back of my hand. So I used to sit with them, tell them what equipment exists in the well, what problems they had, what kind of uh, issues they will face with each single well. So I started giving that uh, kind of advice, but then we decided you know, why can't we create our own team and go firefighting? And that's exactly what happened. By July, yeah. we created the team Incredible. and we went uh, and we did something like uh, 42 wells uh, in 45 days, which is the world record yet. It, it It is an incredible record, and you were very brave, too. I mean, not just fighting the fires, but you, you, you very bravely hid oil well maps and other plans so nobody could find them. Is that a true story? So during the invasion, uh, I mean, like the first three weeks after the two weeks or three weeks after the invasion, I told, uh, you know, I told the management of KOC, we should take all the microfilm of KOC, all the maps out of the head office because eventually the Iraqis will come and occupy the head office. And they agreed. They said, okay, go get it. I said, well, okay, <laughs> I'll get it. What do I do with it? He said, well, you manage, you go get it. And so that's what I did. Actually, wow. I went to the office. I, we sneaked into the office and we had to go under the, you know, there is like a small panel at the bottom of the, the door. We had yeah. to go inside from that panel because we had no keys. And then all the microfilm was in these big safe. And so we had to find the key for the safe. And then, you know, I, I, I removed all the microfilm, all the maps. I put them in my car. I took them home. And then I, uh, you know, I have a built in closet. I had to remove the closet at the bottom of the closet, keep all this microfilm and then rebuild the closet. This is, and it was this there is, until liberation. And then uh, after liberation, uh, I took it back to KOC and they still have it. So. Well, yeah, it, it, it's a very brave story of bravery and courage, uh, I might say. Of course, you ended up in the oil and gas hall of fame. Uh, and uh, I wonder if you sort of use that fame to influence the younger Kuwaitis and tell them the stories of what they have and what you did. 
Well, you see, the, 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 uh, what is so satisfying for me after all these years is when I see all these young engineers, lady engineers, working so hard in the fields. And when I talk to them, they said, you were our aspiration. This is why we are in this business. That's why we are here. I mean, you don't believe how satisfying in this because you open channels, you create life for people. And this is, at the end of the day, that's the best thing in life. Yes, heritage and, and legacy. That that's absolutely right. You became the 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 business development manager of Kuwait Foreign Petroleum Exploration Company, uh, a subsidiary of uh, KPC. Well, was it difficult? Was it tough to grow that business? And was there a feeling at the time that national oil companies should really stick to their own national boundaries? Right. So this is exactly the uh, uh, point, because in the early uh, 90s, KPC thought about this business. We don't need this business. You know, think about it. They started this business in 1981. And by 1992, 93, all what they had is like 80 million barrels of reserves and 30,000 barrels of production. And if you think about it, few wells in Burgan can compensate for this whole big operation. And they had people, offices, I don't know what. So they were thinking this is not core business and we need to get uh, rid of it. Ironically, when we I came into the business with Mr. Ahmed al Arbit, who became the CEO, we, th we looked at it and we said, God, this is a very profitable business. We need just to turn it around. We need to expand it. And this is how you can work with international companies. This is how you can work with governments. This is how you know what is the meaning of an oil business you know because as an operator in a national oil company in kuwait you really don't care about profitability you don't really look at the bottom lines you don't understand the business as it is so it's, it was a, and we managed to turn the company around we managed to bring it from the red into the black and then by the time I left, we had like uh, 200 million barrels of uh, 2P reserves and production up to 70,000. And I think now they are more like 300 and they are still exist and wow. KPC has never existed. So uh, I think <laughs> that's, pretty that's good a record. wonderful story. And yeah. way past boundaries, of course. Well, we can't talk about oil and gas without talking about climate change and the need to phase out fossil fuels. How is Kuwait, Kuwait coping with that? Um, changing industry dynamic and how are you adapting? So, you know, in principle, I think there are a few things that um, people who manage climate change and who promote it didn't get it right. Because what we talk about in the industry is transition. We need to transition from oil and gas into renewable and green fuels. Now, this transition will take time and we shouldn't be killing the business now because if we do, then everybody will suffer. So, right. during so it's this all about timing of these steps. That's it's about saying. timing. Yeah. So people think, you know, we can do it immediately. We should stop investing. It cannot happen like that. Yeah. You need to transition and this transition will take you up to 2050 probably because the amount of energy, uh, the renewable energy we need to add every year with the capital requirement, there is no way on the planet that we can compensate for oil and gas if we stop oil and gas, growing oil and gas. No, at the current levels, even at the current levels, we cannot. We need to maintain the current level and do the transition work in order for the world to transit safely into this renewable uh, world that we all want. So we are not against it uh, at all. All what we are saying is, look, firstly, emission control, carbon sequestering, uh, you know, management of these mega projects that are needed for the world is far more better done by the oil industry than any other industry. We yes. are the people who can build huge platforms. We are the people who can spend the billions in developing, uh, you know, uh, successfully, optimally, cost efficiently, any kind of business. So we have a huge part to play in this transition, even in the renewable. However, this whole thing has to be optimized and worked through time. Yeah. And so, yeah, we I cannot punish and condemn yeah, the oil business. Right. It, it, it can't be rushed. 
uh, it has to be uh, developed, uh, is what you're saying, and you're absolutely right. But this um, is how KPC looks at it, and this is how Kuwait looks at it. I think it took some time for uh, the rest of the world to realize this fact, but I think yeah. we are almost there now. Yes, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Again, you, you hit it uh, the nail on the head. Um, you mentioned briefly how proud you are about your legacy, especially to young female engineers coming into the energy industry. In 2009, you were recognized for being the first, the only woman leader in the oil and gas industry. That's changed, uh, do you think? And has the energy glass ceiling been truly broken up? Oh, big time, big time. Look at it. In Kuwait now, we have two CEOs uh, for KMPC, the largest refining company, is managed by Wafha Al Khatib, a, a, a fellow engineer. And the PIC, the biggest petrochem uh, company, is led by Nadia Al Haji, another fellow engineer. So we have two CEOs, we have so many in various management level, uh, you know, lady engineers. And this is something that, uh, you know, I couldn't have dreamed of uh, <laughs> during those days, yeah. Well, after an incredible career, have you retired from the world of oil, or is that the wrong oh, word? Are, come are you on. a lady of leisure now, Sarah? Or what? What is next for Sarah Akbar? No, 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 no. I don't <laughs> think I will ever retire. You know, I think as long as I can bring value to anything, I'll continue to work. So currently, I do. I run a small, uh, it's a regional service company in the oil and gas. But I do a lot of relationship development between Kuwait and Iraq. You know, I think the only way in my mind to secure Kuwait is if we have extremely good relationship with all our neighbors. And as a private sector company, we have a big role in developing this relationship and creating these win-win situations. So I spend a lot of time going to Iraq, going to the region, trying to develop those relationships and create opportunities for private sector uh, developing uh, business between the two, because I think the economic relationships will surpass any kind of political uh, agenda. I think economy, economic uh, uh, agenda should always be at the forefront and the political agenda should follow. And this is the, the way I think about it and I do. And I, as well, I am on the board of several companies. Uh, you know, I work in renewable uh, energy as well. I try to develop some kind of renewable business. So I'm still very active. And I think as long as I can bring value, I will continue to work. The day I feel, look, you know, there's no value for me here, I'll stop. <laughs> well, one last question, uh, Sarah, going back to an earlier um, strand of our chat. As the energy transition proceeds, is there a great danger of stranded assets both above and below the ground in the region? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, it's not stranded. You know, the time, uh, you know, you will always need an oil and gas because at the end of the day, from the beginning, I think it is very wrong to burn oil and gas as fuel. But as you know, we use it in petrochem, we use it in plastics, we use it in so many different things. That utilization of oil and gas will continue forever. And I think, you know, you will find more utilization for uh, oil and gas in, in, in products. Now, why this region? Because simply, the amount of reserve available is in this region is higher than anywhere else. And secondly, the cost of production here is very competitive. That's why I always say the last barrel of oil will always be produced from this part of the world for those two factors. Well, Sarah, thank you. That concludes our podcast for today. Thank you so much, Sarah Akbar, uh, a lady of leisure, not for a very long time, I suspect, and for providing us with some great insights on Kuwait's past and present. The Foundation very much looks forward to speaking to you again in future. And thank you for listening. Uh, be sure to keep up to date with all of the Alatea Foundation's work by following us on X, formerly known as Twitter, and YouTube. And you can find us under our name. From me, Stephen Cole, goodbye.